Today we're going to learn about evolution and the evidence that supports this theory. The first aim is to describe the conditions that affect an organism's chance of survival. Then we're going to explain the processes of evolution through natural selection and the process of speciation, two different things. And then finally we're going to look at the evidence that supports evolution. I'm going to start off with a story about the Heike crab, which is found in Japan. Now if you look at the structure of the shell or the carapace, you can see it has features very much like a face. More specifically, many Japanese fishermen may tell you it's the face of a samurai warrior. Now how can it be that a small innocuous sea-dwelling crustacean bears the likeness of a samurai warrior on its shell? I mean, what advantage could it possibly give the crab? Well, the story behind the shell is very interesting. In ancient Japan, there were two samurai tribes that were at war. One tribe was much larger in number than the other, and the smaller tribe, rather than waiting for their death, decided to fling themselves into the ocean and die under their own terms. Since this event, it has been thought that when Japanese fishermen catch a crab which is a similar resemblance to a samurai warrior, rather than eating it or taking it for eating, they would throw it back into the oceans. And that's because they believed that these crabs were the reincarnation of the fallen samurai warriors. If a crab looked more like a samurai warrior, it was thrown back into the ocean, therefore had a better chance of surviving and passing on the gene that codes for this feature. So over hundreds of years, this process of selection was chipping away at this crab's carapace until it looked almost identical to that of a Japanese samurai warrior's face. Now, I love that story, as do many. But it wouldn't be right to just leave you with that story because there are other theories behind this feature. Some scientists believe that actually this crab isn't particularly tasty, so fishermen were unlikely to eat it. Other scientists have reported similar features on other species of crab, meaning that this face isn't specific to just the Heike crab. In fact, they think it's a pretty standard structure if you want to attach muscles conveniently to the shell. I think this illustrates something quite remarkable about science. As much as scientists love a good story, we can't be precious about them and we have to let go of such stories in light of new evidence. And it's through this that the scientific process has so much integrity. Now, the theory of evolution through natural selection was, of course, made famous by the British scientist Charles Darwin. Though there were other scientists who were forming very similar ideas, such as Alfred Russell Wallace. You can actually see Darwin's story detailed on the back of a £10 note. If you look carefully, you'll see the HMS Beagle, which was the ship he sailed on as a young man, where he basically made most of his observations. Through observing many species, such as his famous finches, he made the following observations. Firstly, organisms compete over limited resources. Secondly, organisms always produce too many offspring. In other words, some will die due to the fact they're competing over limited resources. And therefore, only the fittest will survive. By fittest, he meant those organisms with the best chance of reproducing, or at least surviving till a reproductive age, so that they could pass on their genes. So over time, environmental conditions chip away at a population, ensuring only the fittest survive. This is the process of natural selection. So the question is, how does Mother Nature select specific characteristics in an organism? Nature presents a series of environmental conditions that cater better for certain features than others. These environmental factors can be living or biotic factors or non-living, abiotic factors. Biotic factors involve other organisms, so for example, things such as disease or how many predators there are or how much prey is available or food that's available and also how much competition exists over limited resources. Non-living factors refer to the parts of the environment that aren't living, such as temperature or the amount of water or rainfall or even the levels of pollution in an area. All these factors act on a population. They can lead to a population increase. For example, if there's more food available, then the population will grow. It can cause a population decrease. So, for example, if there are more predators or more disease, then the population will shrink. They can also affect the population distribution. So, for example, climate change means that now certain areas can be colonised by organisms that usually inhabit hotter areas. So certain species are actually migrating away from the equator and finding homes elsewhere. So that's what we mean by environmental conditions that affect an organism's chance of survival. Aim 1. So now let's look at evolution through natural selection in more detail. 
Now, I've developed a writing frame for this that will help you answer any question on natural selection. In this writing frame, the pink X represents the species we're talking about, the blue Y represents the feature that gives the organism an advantage, and Z details the nature of the advantage. So the idea is if you can substitute X, Y, and Z into this writing frame for the species you're talking about, you'll get it right every time. So firstly, a mutation creates variation in the, let's say, giraffe population. So I'm going to be talking about giraffes. Sometimes it's just sexual reproduction creates variation, but I'm going to focus on mutations in this example. So next, some giraffe, the species, now have longer necks than others, so the feature. So you can see this giraffe has a longer neck than this one. Now I have to describe the advantage that feature brings. So some giraffe are now better at reaching food at higher levels. This reduces their competition. The next two statements require no modification. You can just write them as they are. This increases their chances of survival and therefore reproductive success. You must always include the idea of reproduction into any question on natural selection because that's how genes are passed on and features are inherited. Without this, evolution cannot occur. The next important point is evolution acts on populations and it takes time from generation to generation. It doesn't happen within one lifetime. So you have to specify over many generations, and here's the feature, longer necks become commonplace in the giraffe population. And this works for any organism. For example, a mutation creates variation in the polar bear population. Some polar bears now have whiter fur than others. Some polar bears are now better at camouflage and therefore better at catching prey and avoiding hunters. This increases their chances of survival and reproductive success. And over many generations, white fur becomes commonplace in the population. Or a mutation creates variation in the bacteria population. Some bacteria now have a resistance to an antibiotic. So some bacteria are now better at surviving the antibiotic which is taken by the patient. This increases their chances of survival and reproductive success. And over many generations, antibiotic resistance becomes commonplace in the bacteria population. It works for any species with any feature. Just use it. It's important to note that scientists can observe the same thing, yet come up with different hypotheses. In other words, statements they can test. So the key point about Darwin's observations is that change occurs over generations. It affects populations and not individuals. Whereas another scientist, Lamarck, believed that the change occurs within an individual's lifetime. In other words, through an inner desire to change, the organism will actually develop the feature they want to help them survive the environmental conditions. Now this may sound ridiculous, but think about it like this. Imagine you're observing a blacksmith. As they work away, hammering at the steel and so on, they develop bigger muscles. Now obviously bigger muscles helps you do the job better. So the idea is that the blacksmith's offspring will inherit those muscles to help them cope with the same job. Now of course, this theory isn't heavily supported by evidence, whereas this one is. So that's why we have rejected Lamarck's idea and have accepted Darwin's idea although sometimes even evidence isn't enough to please certain people. Darwin's idea put him in direct conflict with the church, who believed that God created all life on earth. But it's important to know that Darwin's theory of evolution is heavily supported by evidence, and that's why it's a theory. Many people think that a theory is just a throwaway idea, or I have this theory. It's not. In science, a theory is basically an idea that is so heavily supported by evidence that we believe it to be true. So now let's look at the idea of speciation, which is similar but fundamentally different to the idea of evolution. Populations evolve when the frequency of a specific characteristic, or if you want to get technical, allele, within a population changes from generation to generation. So if you look at this population of, let's say, any species, you can see that these two have a different characteristic to these. Now, after these reproduce in the second generation, you can see that there's a higher frequency of this characteristic and a lower frequency of this characteristic. Therefore, the population is evolving. So this feature could be the frequency of blue eyes in the human population or the frequency of antibiotic resistance in a bacterial population. Evolution doesn't necessarily result in the formation of a new species. It just says that populations change over time. And we'll look at the evidence for that in a bit. 
Speciation, however, is when new species are created from existing ones, and often people think that's what evolution is, but it's not. It's speciation. So if you ever have to answer a question on speciation, this is the process. Firstly, a barrier, it could be a geographical barrier, which is what I'm going to show you, but the barrier can also be more subtle, divides a population causing reproductive isolation. So here we have an island and these represent different organisms of the same species on that island. Now the island's connected so they can all meet and reproduce and pass on their genes to the next generation. However, let's say an earthquake starts to happen and the island gets separated. This is an example of a geographical barrier. But barriers don't have to be this extreme. For example, you can have time barriers instead. So to avoid competition, certain organisms start hunting at night, whereas others start hunting at day. So they end up occupying different time zones. This will also create a barrier that leads to reproductive isolation. In other words, this group can no longer reproduce with this group. So a barrier divides a population causing reproductive isolation. That's essential. The second step says that each subgroup experiences different environmental conditions. So let's say originally the island was subjected to very rainy, wet conditions, and that's still true for these members. But now they're separated, this subgroup are now subjected to hotter, drier conditions. Of course, this again is a very dramatic example. It could be more subtle, like for example, on this island, you have different predators active to this island. The presence of different environmental conditions now means natural selection can take place, favouring different features within each subgroup. So natural selection acts on each subgroup. This means over many generations, these individuals that are experiencing now new climatic or environmental conditions will start to develop new features, which are better suited. In other words, they increase the chance of survival in these environmental conditions. So over time, and I do mean a lot of time, that's the problem. A lot of these things are hard to observe, so some people are quite quick to reject this idea. But over a lot of time, new species evolve that can no longer interbreed with the founder species. In other words, these become so genetically different over time that if you were to reunite them with the species they evolved from, they would no longer be able to successfully reproduce. And that is one of the definitions of a species, the ability to successfully reproduce. So now they are different species. So just to summarise, a barrier divides a population causing reproductive isolation. Each subgroup experiences different environmental conditions. Natural selection acts on each subgroup. And over time, new species evolve that can no longer interbreed with the founder species. And that is speciation. Notice how it's different to describing the process of evolution through natural selection. And that's how we explain the process of evolution through natural selection and the process of speciation. Now let's look at the evidence that supports evolution, or in other words, the evidence that we evolved from a single common ancestor. You see, our DNA, that information-carrying molecule that's present in almost every cell in our body, bears a similarity to the DNA in every other organism on this planet that has ever been and that ever will be. And DNA research has allowed us to make that claim. So this diagram shows an evolutionary timeline. Each circle represents one species. As time goes on, new species evolve. So these two species have evolved from this common ancestor. And you can imagine if there's something here, these two species evolve from this common ancestor, and so on, and so on. And these two species from this one. Because these two have evolved from the same common ancestor, you expect them to have very similar DNA. And what I mean by that is the sequence of bases that make up DNA is going to be very, very similar. So, for example, if this was human DNA and this was chimp DNA, we have very, very similar DNA. In fact, 98.5% match, more or less. So, logically, we probably evolved from a common ancestor. Whereas these species will have similar DNA because they evolved from this common ancestor. But we will be very genetically different to these. So the idea is that as time goes on, new species diverge or evolve. Diverge means splinter off the tree. Um, evolve from existing ones. And because closely related species, such as these two, diverge more recently, we'd expect them to have similar DNA. A good real-world example of this is this could represent dolphins and whales, which are very genetically similar. And this could uh, basically 
represent sharks. Now, even though dolphins and sharks and whales look similar, that's because they share very similar environmental conditions and therefore environmental pressures. They all hunt similar food, for example. They end up looking quite similar, but genetically they're very, very far apart because they've come from different common ancestors. So DNA research provides very compelling evidence for evolution. Secondly, one of the biggest arguments against evolution is the idea that we can't see it happen. But we have definitely experienced evolution. Take, for example, rats. Rats used to be killed by a poison called warfarin. Now, over time, some rats developed a resistance to warfarin, so warfarin had no more effect. Now, you can imagine this provides a very, very strong selective force. For example, rats that eat cheese soaked in warfarin, now some may die, and those which have the gene for resistance will survive. So very quickly, the environmental conditions, in other words, the use of warfarin, will get rid of those which do not have warfarin resistance, leaving behind those which do. They will survive, they will reproduce, they will pass on their genes to the offspring, and so very soon you'll get a whole population of warfarin-resistant rats. This is exactly how antibiotic resistance develops in bacteria as well. And you can see that example on the treating infection tutorial. So why is Darwin's theory of evolution accepted over, let's say, someone like Lamarck's? Firstly, it's heavily supported by evidence. And secondly, the scientific community have shared and discussed the evidence to make sure it's valid and reliable. This sharing and discussion of data and evidence can be achieved in the three following ways. Firstly, a scientist can publish their work in a scientific journal. Now, scientific journals basically allow scientists to repeat the experiments that the original scientists did and find out if the results are actually reliable. In other words, do they also get the same results? If they did, then it becomes reliable. Secondly, scientists can undergo something called a peer review. That's when their work is critically looked at by other scientists to find out if their methods was of a sufficient standard to get or to achieve very accurate results, so was it valid? If a scientist's work passes a peer review, then it's a good sign that this theory could be accepted. Finally, um, scientists can hold conferences where they present and share ideas where it can be discussed openly within the scientific community. So to summarise, the evidence for evolution comes in two forms, DNA research and looking at resistant organisms. And this evidence has been validated by other scientists using journals or peer reviews or scientific conferences. And that is how we explain the evidence for evolution.